very good evening. I am Amrita and for all of you all who joined us a bit later, I extend a very warm welcome on behalf of Sarvaya Arts Foundation. Our next speaker, Madhur Gupta. Madhur Gupta is considered as one of the leading ODC artists of his generation. Uh, he took his initial training in Kathak under Pandit Birju Maharaj and is currently taking his advanced training in ODC under dancer and guru Sharon uh, Lovan in the uh, in the Padma Vibhushan Guru Kelucharan Mohapatra style of ODC. More recently, he authored the bestseller Quoting Hindustan. Madhur is also the founder of the performing arts school Sangeet Vidya Niketan in New Delhi. Madhur. Sarvanam Majha Namaskar. Sarmaya India ni Amantrit Kelia Badal Mala Atyant Saman Vatato. Special thanks to Paul Abrahamji for having uh, created this great movement called Sarmaya Talks. We were having this conversation that it is so essential to not just disseminate information or to learn it or to, you know, as an artist, yes, we need stage, but somebody needs to document it as well. Right, so quickly jumping into my talk for today. Uh, when I received the invitation to talk uh, at this esteemed stage, I was given an open field into deciding upon the topic I would like to focus on for this event, keeping in mind, of course, my book, uh, Quoting Hindustan, which was released last year. Now, I chose not to be extremely redundant about making a point on how relevant courtesans were in the Indian society and how they were repositories of high art because uh, my book is actually the medium through which I wanted to make this point and uh, um, uh, not to brag but uh, it being a bestseller I think it tells me that it has already made a point reached the right audience so then when I thought a little deeper about it I came on to the fact that you know what I might like to talk about the topic of morality the art of diplomacy and the political prowess that these courtesans had in their lifetimes. Because let us not forget, as Vidyadipi spoke, their patrons were very powerful people and they had the ear of the king majorly. So through their soft twists and turns of their wrist, they could actually shape up a nation. And uh, yeah, so that was my initial thought and that is what we went along with. But then, during my research for the talk, an even more essential sub-theme hit me, which was the concept of morality. Because morality is such a personal and such a cultural interpretation on what is right, what is wrong, and how does one feel about it. So, I would like to read this uh, introduction, which is there in my book. In antiquity, it was typical for the best-looking women in the country to devote themselves for the gratification of not just one, but many individuals. And this I'm talking about ancient India. These women competed to acquire for the title of Nagarvadhu, which literally translates to being the wife of the entire city. They charged 100 sharpanas per night, which meant that their treasury grew to be much larger than many uh, powerful people of their time. Uh, apart from court, in ancient scriptures, agamas, uh, the practice of uh, temple worship through dance and music is also mentioned. That is why we have these terms like Devadasis, which translates to Devki Dasi, servant of the God, or Mahanaris, Mah Mahari, sorry, Mahanaris, you know, who uh, were actually wedded to the temple deities and their ex like. Their entire function was to act as the wife of the god. During this era, royal patrons provided them with donations of property, assets, both in terms of land and livestock and ornaments. This is ancient India. As we move towards the medieval India, Tawaiyas became a predominantly North Indian enterprise, fundamental to the ethos of the Mughal dynasty from the 16th to the 19th centuries. It is also well known that younger Nawabs to be was sent to these women of culture to learn Tehzeeb Tamiz. Now, what does that mean? It means to be, become connoisseurs because these young princes were supposed to become the patrons of the entire country that they held. 
So they were taught to enjoy great music, literature, poetry, and even perceive it as a lifelong activity. By the 18th century, the, the role of Tawayas was very firmly established into the society of Northern India. Now what was happening in the South? In the Deccan also, Tawayas enjoyed a prestigious role in the Nizami culture as they were considered musicians and it was customary for all major events uh, of the Nawabs and of the Nizams uh, to have a Tawayas. So it is a very, uh, it's a very sweet anecdote that uh, in any wedding ritual that used to happen, there used to be a photograph which was taken at the end of it. There used to be a seat reserved for the Tawayas to sit. Uh, for that photograph, you know, amongst all these uh, patrons because the wives were actually a symbol of affluence and only the rich and uh, the wealthy could afford them. So, moving further down, you know, from the south, sorry, from the Deccan to the south, we of course had Devadasis and Maharis who were dedicated to the temples and were even married to the temple deity. So, how it used to happen was that on a chosen day, a young girl of course from the community of the Devadasis and the Maharis was taken to the temple. A sari was uh, taken from the deity's uh, idol and tied across the head of that young girl. Uh, another thread, which is as you can know is as Mangal Sutra, called different terms in different states, was also tied around that girl's neck and then automatically she became married to the temple deity and she was termed as Nitya Sumangali. Nitya Sumangali means a woman whose husband can never die because God can never die. So she would always remain um, like, uh, and act as a married woman and like I said, their entire function was to uh, act out the wifely duties of those times which is from waking the God up to dancing for him uh, making me eat food, putting him to sleep. But having said so, they, these women were humans and uh, also they came from a very strong matrilineal lineage. So they did engage with uh, their mortal counterparts and did take on partners who could range from the temple priest, courtiers to even kings. And it was very much an accepted norm. Now these courtesans are artists who are carriers of nation's enormous history, creating cultural movements by their strokes and turnings of the wrists. These holders of enormous instincts should not be thought of just as the creators of kothas or as commodities who perform to appease the monarch or to receive a heavy hand of gold. At the core of this institutional institution, courtesans had a deeper divine purpose of uplifting the mundane world of mortals, allowing them to envision the bigger picture. The metaphysical was always a parallel stream which flowed alongside the institution of courtesans, even though it had been brought down by socio-economic upheavals, majorly and especially in the last century. So, talking about the slander and the bringing down of this age-old institution which we collectively known as the courtesan culture of India, it actually began with the conquest of the region of Avadh by the British in 1856. It can be regarded as the earliest execution warrant for the ancient enterprise of courtesans. Suddenly, the British, the new patrons, didn't really value the courtesan culture and these women were class classified as carnal criminals. Cultural intellectuals rejected courtesan culture as social debauchery. Not another thought was given to how these pioneering women made a significant contribution to the refinement of society. The hypocritical character of the colonial masters came to light when on one hand they detested the sight of the so-called temple harlots. Yet on another hand these women were forced into prison cantonments against their will for the pleasure of their soldiers. The Cantonment Act of 1864 and its revised version, Contagious Disease Acts, this is uh, very amusing, were actually an attempt to slander and bring down the name of these professional women entertainers because the British feared that they would spread homosexuality amongst their soldiers. I uh, can't understand how they arrived at this, but anyway. The British view of Devadasis was one of deep-rooted misunderstandings 
stemming majorly from misogyny. These women who devoted themselves to, to their regional Hindu temples had sustained intimate ties with men from a high socio-economic class. These ties were typically polyamorous romantic affairs with a number of social superiors. Now, when again I was researching about this particular talk, uh, like Vidya ji is a musician, I also am a dancer, so when I wrote the book or when I'm thinking about this talk, I'm talking and thinking from a dancer's point of view. Now in Odyssey, there is this genre uh, of poetry called Ashtapadis or eight stanzas. Uh, uh, it's called Gita Govinda, which was written by Jaydev in the 12th century in Odisha. So there are many Ashtapadis where different states of relationship between Krishna and Radha are found in different, different poetry and it's a progression. There is a piece where uh, Radha has been waiting overnight uh, for Krishna to come and she had sent, she had sent her friend also to bring Krishna back. But having lost all hope, when the friend also does not return, she feels really miserable. And she says, Yami he kami ha sharanam, sakhi jana vachana vanchita, he na, ab me kiski sharanam jau, mujhe to sabhi meri sakhi ne, mere Krishna ne, mere sabhi, all my loved ones have deserted me. So when, again, I was going through my talk, it really felt that this might have been the mental state of the courtesans who were facing this slander. So I will just quickly, shortly present you this uh, Ashtapati. Yami ke kami sharadu, sati jana vachana vanchita, sati yata samay, kare ho me samay ke nahi aaye, and I think I should you know this, this earth should open and I should go inside it. I should burn myself into fire. This Yamuna river, maybe I should come. It's a very, very deep, dark uh, kind of a poetry. But uh, to let you understand and myself also understand how we should transmit it, let's, let's uh, try to explore this, uh, through this Ashtabhi. Hmm. I can understand the destituteness, the helplessness that these courtesans might have felt at be, by being wrongly slandered. And the slander came from the concept of poly polyamorous nature, uh, the kind of relationships that they had, which violated the conventional Abrahamic British understandings of the 
mortal union and spiritual behavior. The erotic aspect of the Devadasi professions was mostly rejected by the British. The then government concentrated on sexual placement of the courtesans in Indian society and introduced laws accordingly. From 1860s onwards, prosecutions for temple harlotry became much more popular. The tensions between India and the British society became increasingly evident as British lawmakers passed further legislations against Devadasi traditions. Inevitably, the then IPC conferred various activities of Devadasi culture as a legal crime. Now, while British sensibil sensib sensibilities became offended by the sexual conducts of the Devadasis, the new masters were bizarrely unfamiliar with the customary privileges enjoyed by them in the Indian society. For some reason, that was not investigated. Within the Indian legislation, Devadasis were given land and ownership rights, otherwise unthinkable for women at that time. Ironically, while many forms of slavery beneficial to the British, you know, whether it was indigo or whether it was uh, cotton, you know, they all were tolerated. Devadasis, which was starkly a religious agency, was identified as, a, as an illegal mode of prostitution. The then officials, knowing their short-sightedness in banning Devadasis, issued a variety of weak and appalling explanations which included the fact of being protected against homosexuality, like I mentioned. Now, there is uh, this very intense research paper by uh, a lady called Veena Talwar. Her paper is called Lifestyle as Resistance, the Case of the Courtesans of Lucknow. Her analysis of the civ civic tax records from the 1858 to 77 reveals that Tawaiyas were in fact the largest and highest tax paying class with the largest individual earning from anyone within the city. Imagine how rich they were. The article also mentions the systematic repression done by the British on the courtesan establishment after, of course, the rebellion of 19, sorry, 1857. The paper reads as such. The courtesans' names were also on list of property. Houses, orchards, manufacturing and retail establishments for food and luxury items confiscated by British officials for their proven involvement in the siege of Lucknow and the rebellion against British rule in 1857. These women, though confirmed non-combatants, were penalized for their instigation of and pecuniary assistance to the rebels. On yet another list, some 20 pages long, are recorded the spoils of war seized from one of the set of female apartments in the palace and garden complex called Kesar Bagh in Lucknow where some of the deposed ex-king Wajid Ali Shah's 300 or more consorts resided. It is a remarkable list, a long, eloquently evocative of a privileged existence. Now hear this list, it's very interesting. Gold and silver ornaments studded with precious gemstones, embroidered cashmere wool and brocade shawls, the jeweled cap and shoes, silver gold jade and amber handled fly wrists, silver cutlery, Jade goblets, plates, spittoons, hookahs, and silver utensils for serving, storing food and drink, and valuable furnishings. I mean, what a luxurious and privileged lifestyle did these courtesans enjoy? Now, even in the context of our times, if a government wishes to bring a profound conversion in the mentality of an entire generation, it takes to influencing the root of all understanding which is education. The same thing happened in the British India as well. Equipped with a Western degree willing to prove their worth to their British masters, several Indian Babus and Maim Sahibs resolved to put an end to the once majestic courtesan culture in India. British sensibilities, due to their limited understanding of Indian society, clubbed all women entertainers, whether they practiced high art, or were street performers as women of low moral character. Now, this is one thing also which I want to convey to, I mean, I'm sure I'm in presence of August audience, but uh, this, is a, this is an understanding that courtesans were all of same categories. But uh, that wasn't so. Uh, there was a category called ganikas, 
who were basically a very low class of performing women. Then there was a class of Nagar Vajhus who were basically the Tipikas and the Madhuris of that time and everything in between, you know. So it was not just one category. Now, this led Indians with a misguided sense of morality to move for the banishment of these glorious performers completely. It can be safely inferred that because these unorthodox women did not serve any British cause or purpose, they became victims of censorship. Uh, I, I was just sitting and someone talked about that musicians and artists are still looked down upon and, you know, uh, treated in a manner which is not very conducive to respectability. I uh, have a very mm, close feeling about it because the moment one says that one is an artist, there is this insinuation that they are available, that uh, they would be of, will of lose moral fibre, which wasn't so back then and I don't think isn't so now because to be an artist needs much strength within to relentlessly continue. If you read my book, in the last chapter of uh, Bala Saraswati, who was a very famous uh, Bharatanatyam dancer uh, of our times, she might have been a courtesan, but in her entire lifetime, she just took on one partner, one companion, uh, who was actually the first finance minister of India, Mr. R.K. Shanmugam, in the Nehru, uh, Nehru's cabinet. So, uh, when people think that courtesans were exploited and they were, you know, uh, used for the benefit and for the pleasure of their patrons, it, they any woman or man working in a public uh, sector is vulnerable to all these situations, all this bandwidth. Yes, there are instances where you are exploited, where you are taken advantage of, but in my research what I actually came through was that the relationship between the patron and the courtesan was of much love and sensitivity. Because usually what used to happen that uh, these high uh, earning patrons were married to women uh, of high class who were actually not educated. So they could not be intellectually stimulated. And with courtesans who were refined in all arts, chaosat kalai hoti thi, so sab mein refined hoti thi, they used to find that kind of companionship which was very sensitive and soft and very loving. So again, uh, when I thought of, through my dance, there is this another Ashtapadi called uh, Priya Charushile. So Priya Charushile mein kya hota hai ki uh, after spending a night somewhere, Krishna comes to Radha and says uh, ki uh, Priya Charushile, you are my dearest beloved, munch mai maan anidala. Ye jo maan tu kar rahi ho, usko chodo, I am here, let's rejoice. Sapati Mother Nan Nagar. Achanak se ye aag, Madan ki aag, me me bhas mo ra ho. Apne ye poto ko, agar tum zara sa muskura ho, to ye jo chandrama hai, ye thi fika ho jayega. Apne ye madhupan ka mujhe raspan karne do kriya. Mm-hmm.
Now, the Madras Devadasi Prevention Act uh, actually proved to be the final nail in the coffin against courtesan culture. This was actually sadly brought down around by the very Indians who were supposed to revel in the rich performing arts heritage of our nation. In this attempt to save Devadasis from a life of debauchery, a lady called Mutulakshmi Reddy introduced the bill in Madras State Assembly in the early 1930. It was passed in the 1947. Due to heavy objections by the Devadasis across the Madras state, the recommended bill was adopted only as a private act and not as a public legislation. Several women from traditional performing arts communities, due to this act being introduced, lost their livelihoods, home, dignity and honour due to the introduction of this act. But even during such unrestrained onslaught against their culture, these women performers remain steadily devoted to the pursuance of their lifelong dedication. Again, there is a very sad but evoking anecdote of one of the last standing Devadasis of Madras, Mailapur Gauri Ammal. She was attached to the Kapaleshwar temple and during the growing surge of anti-Devadasi resentment, unrest and the emergence of statutory stigmatization of the regime, Gauri was forcefully expelled from her residence at Kacheri Lane by the temple authorities. It is then reported that she chose another residence from where the Gopuram, the, the spire of the Kapalishra temple, could be seen from the window. And she would dance every night in her house, looking at the spire and pay her duties. Again, the very nature, very, very eros erogenous and erotic nature with which India has been brought up with, you know, whether you see Kunar or Khajuraho or any, any of those temples, you know, which are laden with uh, sculptures, you know, which we see. I believe India was and was, is a very rich and wholesome country where the pleasures and finer things in life are really celebrated. <laughs> there is one very funny anecdote of my guru Sharon Lohenji. She says that uh, one neighbor of hers, when she was very young and learning Odyssey from her guru Kelicharan Mohapatraji, a neighbor of hers came to her mom carrying the book of Gita Govinda and told to her mother uh, that your daughter is reading porn. Right? Because Gita Govinda is so erotic and so sensual in nature on, 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 the, on the shallow shallow level if you see, you know, if you just see the action, but if you actually read about the Indian ethos, about Gaudiya Vaishnavism, about uh, Shaktism, the way to moksha is through Bhogavilas, right? So when we talk about Krishna and Radha, all these things that I'm showing you, it is actually not just about two lovers. It's basically, as far as our understanding goes, Atma and Paramatma, you know? Because we two are separated from each other and in this quest to become one and for the general public 
to understand this concept, these stories are enunciated on characters. So, I will show you another last uh, Ashtapadi for today, which is called Kuru Yadunandan Chandana Shishira Tarena Karena Payodhare. This is one of the most erotic Ashtapadis found in the Gita Govinda, where, and this is also one of the last Ashtapadis uh, mentioned in Gita Govinda, where Radha and Krishna have had their mortal union. And now Radha, who has merged with Krishna in all, on her entirety, you know, both spiritual and physical, she now commands with love to Krishna to give her identity back to her. So, she asks him to take this chandal, but dear, your hands, which are cooler than this chandal, please use them and design beautiful motives on my dress. The Mrigamata, the mask, so beautiful. playback even live they all had to sing and dance so just to wrap up my uh, small talk for today this Devadasi act uh, which was established in Madras also spurred several other acts into being a few of them were the 1934 Bom Bombay Devadasi Protection Act uh, 1957 Bombay Protection Act and the 1988 Andhra Pradesh Devadasi Act these acts were actually the one who sounded the death knell for the courtesan and Devadasi culture, which was once the pride of the nation. If you see my book, there are 10 courtesans mentioned, uh, Amrapali. She challenged the Lichavi clan and won the favor of Gautam Buddha, Vasan Sena. 
she also did not give in to the whims of the evil brother of the king and kept her integrity. Rukmati was exceptionally uh, essential in the downfall of the Mughal uh, general and also kept her integrity. Begum Samru, a very keen statesman, was actually the go-to between Shah Alam II of Delhi and all the other rising forces of those times, whether it was the Maratha, Sikhs, uh, Jats, even the European powers. Gohar Jan, uh, what do I say after Didi talk? Jan Ki Bai even. Jatin Bai, one of the first women, not just producers, but also directors of the Indian film industry. Begum Akhtar. Uh, Begum Akhtar is actually very interesting because she did marry uh, Mr. Abbasi to gain respectability. But after Mr. Abbasi lost his estate, she was actually the one who had to go back to singing and to bring back the glorious days of how they lived. And of course, Bala Saraswati, who was awarded one of the highest uh, awards by the Indian government, Padma Bhushan, for her contribution to the Indian classical arts and also by opening the Western doors for any Indian art to go, before which no Westerner knew what Indian classical artist is. So the legacy of Indian courtesans is a testament to the enduring power of morality, diplomacy and political acumen. Mm -hmm. Despite facing societal censure and moral condemnation, these women navigated the complexities of their world with grace, dignity and resilience. Through their artistry, intellect and charisma, they transcended the limitations imposed upon them, leaving an indelible mark on the annals of history. As we reflect on the lives of Indian courtesans, we are reminded of the profound interconnectedness of morality, diplomacy and political prowess. In their stories, we find echoes of our own struggles and triumphs, underscoring the timeless relevance of the legacy in shaping the moral and political fabric of our society. May we continue to draw inspiration from their example as we navigate the complexity of our own time, guided by the enduring principles of virtue, integrity and compassion. Thank you all very much. This is a lovely, lovely time speaking for you. I also must uh, mention uh, my colleague, uh, Narita Dave, who came on a very short notice and accompanied me. Thank you all. Thank you. Subscribe to Sarmaya and be a part of the stories and conversations around art, history and culture.